Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Everybody sees signs. I'm not talking about street signs. I mean the things we see in life. We look at a withering tree, a flock of birds, or we experience something painful or joyous, and we assign meaning. That's how human beings make sense of the world. That's why grown men put their socks on the same way before every baseball game. They assign meaning to something mundane, and suddenly a pair of old socks hold power. But that's the problem. Insofar as the meaning we assign comes from the human heart, it can't help but be selfish. I mean, let's be serious. Do you really believe that God, or your magical God of baseball stockings, cares about the outcome of your silly baseball game? At the same time, who has ever seen or heard of a baseball player who understands his locker room ritual as a sign that we have neglected the poor, or a warning that we have not obeyed God's teaching? Who among us sees a joyous sign as a stern reminder of duty, or a painful sign as a reminder of the Lord's mercy? As our friend St. Mark is wont to remind us, only those who have ears to hear. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 19 to 26. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 185 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We've come back to the fig tree. We've moved through this section of Mark. Jesus, earlier in the chapter, saw a fig tree in leaf, was looking for something to eat, and was disappointed, and then essentially said in scriptural terms, Amen. It's almost an acknowledgement, Richard, of the situation. If you don't want to submit to my father's instructions and bear fruit, remember in Genesis, God commands everything to be fruitful. The animals, the earth, people, be fruitful, multiply. If the fig tree rejects that commandment, okay, fine. May no fruit ever come from you again. And the situation is not going to change because if the tree is in leaf, it's already too late. Right. We see this in the prophets because the prophets are saying, this is the destruction that's going to come upon you from the nations. It's not because God swoops in and starts slashing and burning in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, by failing to follow Torah, made friends with one Gentile nation, which then angered another Gentile nation, and then lo and behold, that other Gentile nation then came and attacked and destroyed them. So Israel then wanted to count on some Gentile nation rather than Torah and God to protect them. So the inevitable result is that Israel was then destroyed. I mean, that's how Hosea talks about the Assyrians, and that's how Jeremiah talks about the Babylonians. This is how things work. And so oftentimes we think that God is going in and manipulating things, when in fact God is simply, through the prophets, acknowledging the truth and the factuality of what's happening on the ground. And there's a technique that Mark uses. He'll take a scene and he'll split it and put something else in between. And so then the kind of framing narrative, we call it, the one that was split, helps to explain the one that's in the middle. When we have this image of the fig tree, which then is followed by the casting out of the money changers in the temple and the whole prophetic idea of the destruction of the temple it's not because god is going to destroy it it's because there's an inevitability about the destruction of the temple one thing i want to add about verse 14 where he finally curses the fig tree when he curses it and he talks about people 
never eating fruit from you again, the verb for eat is in the aorist and it has something to do with faith. The aoristos is a way of talking about an action that is as good as done, but hasn't been complete. That's why they use the word horizon, orizo. It's a orizo, which means without a horizon. The way that this is used in the New Testament is to explain faith. You trust in something as though it's already complete, as though it's as good as done, and you act as though it's done, even though the action will be complete at some time in the future. And this underscores what we're saying about the way Jesus is cursing the tree. He's not doing anything to the tree. He's not saying it because he's angry per se, though he's angry that it hasn't borne fruit because it disobeyed God. He is simply acknowledging once again, I don't have any faith in Israel to bear fruit. My faith is in the Lord. And since I know Israel can't bear fruit of its own accord, even though the judgment hasn't come, I know they're not going to bear fruit. So now we'll see how that plays out for the tree based on the Lord's trust of the surety of God's promise that man cannot bear fruit of his own accord. When evening came, they would go out of the city. Here again, it's worth mentioning a little subtlety about the Greek. It's a little bit awkward in English. The better translation, but a translation that wouldn't make sense necessarily in English, is whenever evening came. Now this is worth pointing out because this means that Jesus is staying in the vicinity of Jerusalem, but he won't actually sleep in Jerusalem. Correct. They would sleep outside. And so I think the fact that they were always entering but then going back out, they would not reside in Jerusalem. They resided outside, and we saw where they tend to reside, which is, in 12, it was mentioned that they live in Bethany, the house of the poor, rather than in the center of power, Jerusalem. Again, it's Ezekiel. The Lord is moving in and out of the temple, in and out of the city of the temple. You can't pin the Lord down. Jerusalem does not have any claim to Jesus. They can't control him. They don't own him. He's not the Messiah of Israel. He's the Messiah, as we heard in the turning of the tables with the money changers, of all the nations. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Now here, if you're scriptural, the thought in your mind should not be, oh, Jesus cursed it and now it withered. Ooh, magic. No, it's not magic. Jesus looked at the fig tree scripturally, which means that something mundane, a tree that didn't bear fruit. I can show you 10 trees in Minnesota that have been sitting there and have not been able to produce apples in 10 years. So there are barren fig trees, barren apple trees, barren whatever trees all over the place. Jesus looked at something mundane and ordinary and applied scripture to it and it became a sign. So it's not as though we should be surprised now that it's withered because that's what trees that are dying do, they wither. It's very important. Scriptural people see signs, but they are signs in reverse. Typically people approach the Bible and they project their experience into the text. This is idolatry. You cannot hear voices and then go to the Bible and try to understand the voices you heard in your head, which is what modern spirituality is. It's incorrect. You have to hear scripture, which is written. And then when you see things in the world, see them with scripture in your ear. So that when you're driving through North Dakota and you see farms, you think of the harvest or you think of the sower. And suddenly just this farm that you see becomes a very powerful metaphor. That's what a sign is. The farm then doesn't become a sign to you of McDonald's corporate might and all of the farms that they own. The farm becomes a sign of whatever agrarian metaphors mean in scripture. So this is what Jesus trusts in in Mark. He trusts in the word that teaches him what to say when he sees a dead tree. 
Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. Jesus looked at the tree, applied the text, and stated the obvious from the perspective of the scroll. Peter cannot see the biblical sign because he has no idea what scripture is saying. And so obviously he's surprised. He did not trust the way that Jesus obviously trusted because he knows the system. He understands the Torah. The whole section is about the question of faith. Well, and then if we understand that this is the same image that's going to be used for the temple, as we saw in the previous section, of course, then Peter's going to be surprised when he sees the temple torn down, which Jeremiah was trying to say also, don't be surprised by this. You know, each generation, they hear the word, but then they can't hear it. And this is what Peter is showing the symptoms of. Absolutely. And Jesus answered saying to them, here you go, have faith in God. So this is the problem. They didn't see the fig tree as a sign of the teaching that the works of men's hands cannot bear fruit. They just saw a tree. Jesus, on the other hand, saw it as a sign of disobedience. You were commanded to be fruitful. You're not fruitful. And in this sense, the sign becomes a teaching example. Now Peter still doesn't understand and, even worse, is amazed and surprised. So Jesus has to remind him, you have to have faith. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but trusts slash believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. And here, I have to insist that you hear this correctly in context, the way Dr. Benton was saying a minute ago. This is not magic. If you trust as though the thing that has not happened yet, but has been promised, is already as good as done, remember the aoristos, the special Greek verb form we were talking about, then you will act correctly. Then you will act with a kind of assuredness. But the mountain here is not something you magically move. Jesus is not Hercules. The mountain is another biblical sign. It's taking this giant, potentially eternal thing and moving it and changing it that only the power of God could do because the only thing bigger and more powerful and more eternal than the mountain is God. Now, it's interesting the way that many people interpret this is that as long as you can believe hard enough that God can do any magical trick, then it will happen. But when he says have faith in God, he's not saying have faith in God that God can do everything. Have faith in God that God will do everything according to his will. Have faith in that. And then when you believe, when you trust that God's will is sovereign, not his ability to move things around and perform magic tricks, but his will is sovereign. And if the mountain is to be moved according to God's will, then it will be moved according to God's will. Don't just trust you're going to move God's will to move the mountain for you. How can you move God's will? Because it's inscribed. This is the whole point. You have two things that you deal with if you're scriptural. What's written in the text, which is immovable, like a mountain. And then what happens in life, which you have no control over. So the lesson is, in Mark, you have to hear what is written and submit to it. And then whatever happens, you have to receive it in the light of what is inscribed. That's why there's a reference to the heart, because the text is inscribed in the seat of reason. It has nothing to do with what you feel. If you hear this as a contemporary American, you're going to hear it through the lens of Walt Disney, and then you're going to be confused why you didn't get a Tesla for Christmas. You felt like you really wanted one in your heart, and you asked for it. That's not what's going on here. It's much more about the difficult things you see and the difficult things you endure in life. Do you choose to receive both the curse and the blessing in Mark as a scriptural sign? Again, meaning the sign itself doesn't say anything. The sign reflects what's inscribed in the text. There's a beautiful Jewish story in the Midrash. One of the rabbis is trying to make a point to the other rabbis. And so he prays to God that he'll pick up this tree and move this tree to another spot. And lo and behold, it happens. And all the other rabbis, they say, we don't need to believe in a sign. What we believe is what's in the text. And so later on, the rabbi found out what was God doing at that moment when the other rabbis made this point. He said, God was laughing. 
My children have defeated me because they went with the text over some kind of miracle they saw with their eyes. The text is what was definitive for them, and that's what they had to understand. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. If somebody comes to your town and works miracles but leads people away from what's inscribed in the text, he's a false prophet. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe slash trust that you have received them and they will be granted to you. And this cannot make sense in English unless you once again understand the aoristos. You have received them in the future past as though they've already been received because the promise is as good as the real thing if the promise comes from God. And you have to act as though you've received them, but they have not been received yet. And this is what Jesus does with the fig tree. The judgment has not come. It's not the end times. He's not separating the wheat from the chaff. Yet the judgment has already come because the word stands that you have to submit to the instruction in Genesis to be fruitful. How can you believe you received it and then they will be granted? It's understanding that those things that you will receive are as good as received already. It's just a matter of time, as we say. What are those things then that we believe to have received before we have received them? And those are the things that we are to be praying for. If you think of the fig tree as the first fruits of the judgment, the first sign of the coming judgment, the tree is judged. Now we come to what you have received again in the spirit of the aoristos, the thing that has happened without horizon, meaning it's still coming. What comes out of his mouth next? When you stand praying, forgive. Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. So the thing you received, which comes from the text, is both the curse and the blessing, judgment and forgiveness. And it's prophetic in this sense, because when you go through the scroll of Isaiah, you have potentialities presented. Israel could be blessed. Israel could be cursed. Israel could be blessed. Israel could be cursed. This pattern in the prophets, you know, people say it's death and resurrection. No, it's not about death and resurrection in the prophets. It's about the possibility of life and the possibility of condemnation hinging upon whether or not you choose to place your trust in the instruction, which contains both the judgment and the promise of hope if you submit. You forgive so that your father, and this is interesting, forgive so that your father, is it that God is not able to forgive as he wants to forgive? No, but what he's saying is that the forgiveness that you would have with you has to begin with the forgiveness that you would show to your brother. This is what I was saying before. If you're going to trust in God as protecting your city, you can't go ask a neighboring country, a neighboring nation to protect your city. You can't expect Torah to exist among your people and have God, according to Torah, forgive you if you yourself aren't going to forgive others according to Torah. This is why the authority, people talk about the authority that was given to the disciples to loose and remit. And in the traditional churches, they talk about the priest having the authority to loose and remit sins. It's the authority that we'll hear about in next week's episode when they question the authority of Jesus to preach. The authority comes from the text, and the text posits the forgiveness of sins. And it relates to the money changers in the temple, because the table in the temple was meant to be a place of fellowship between all nations, for which the forgiveness of sins proclaimed in Scripture is a prerequisite. Otherwise, Jews and Greeks will be fighting with each other for all eternity. So it's the forgiveness of sins that's the heart of the matter. But when the priest or the disciple or the teacher forgives you of your sins, they're not forgiving you any more than Jesus cursed the tree. They are acknowledging the factuality of the teaching. You are forgiven. And my job as a teacher is to announce that to you. And in the announcing of that forgiveness, 
to help you apply the judgment of the text, which is also contained in this section in Mark the Curse, to apply that judgment to the things that you confess. And in so doing, it's not I who speak, it's not you who speak, it's the text that speaks. Not even Jesus speaks. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. And this is the word of judgment that comes with forgiveness. You are expecting to receive as though it's already been given, even though the judgment has not come yet. The forgiveness of sins. You're forgiven, but not forgiven. You know how people get in this trap, well, I confess my sins and now I'm all set to go. No, you're not forgiven until that day when you are forgiven, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. But you won't be forgiven on that day if you have not forgiven on this day. So when the priest forgives you, it's not he who's forgiving you. It's the promise of the Father that comes with a warning. If this is to be truly a forgiveness for you on that day, you had better remember to forgive the others. And this is a beautiful feint when he begins to excite the reader by saying you can start to move mountains. He shifts to, but you better make sure you're forgiving others. And we know the way the human heart works. Every human heart wants to move mountains, kill trees, do all sorts of things. But to forgive those we have something against, that's the real effort. And so he redirects our excitement away from moving mountains to forgiving others in order for forgiveness to exist in our lives, in order to acknowledge that which has already happened, which is the forgiveness of God. If we really want to pray for something, if we want to stand and ask for something, it's the ability to forgive others so that God can forgive us. And the insight and the familiarity with Scripture to be able to apply it to everyday ordinary things the way Jesus does in this passage intuitively. That only comes by repetition and hearing. Repetition and hearing and study. So that you simply have these symbols and these metaphors ingrained in your conscience, which is what we mean by heart. The place where you reason, the place where you think the place where you make judgments, so that you too, like Jesus, can read the signs. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.